Dunning-Kruger effect, right? We can simplify this. It actually follows a graph. It's where someone learns a little bit, and all of a sudden they know a lot about that subject, and they feel really confident, and uh, they've overcorrected in their confidence, by assuming they know everything when they really know about that much about the subject. And it kind of slips like this, and if they break the threshold, it will swipe back up to the final point where they might become the world expert on it. And they have as much confidence in the end as they did to begin with when they only knew that much, but they think they know everything. This is the case kind of with everything. I've been doing leather work now for like uh, 20 years, and there's just so much to learn. It's just, it just a thousand little cool techniques. When you start out with it, you think, man, I can make stuff. And then you learn all the stuff that you're not doing that you should be doing to make it look uh, professional and finished. I used to do a lot of cave diving in Florida. That's where you have to have uh, more gear than an astronaut. And I had uh, steel 95 decompression tanks. There's a moth in the room. <laughs> um, four redundancies on cave lights. I had an underwater scooter, oxygen decompression tank when I was done with the dive. And you had to learn... a. a, a Redundant uh, BCD, buoyancy control device, is extremely technical diving. It's insanely dangerous. You're about 100 foot down on average and give you thousands of feet back in, or more inside of a cave. And if an emergency happens, y you're out of luck because you cannot surface. There is no surface. The ceiling is the surface. So you have to make your way back out again. So everything has to be technically planned and perfect. I knew this guy, he had all the gear and he became a full cave diver. And uh, he knew about that much, and he think he knew everything. And then he ended up dead a couple weeks later. So that's the Dunning-Kruger effect. Um, it's certainty over wisdom. It's uh, hubris, really. We don't need to say Dunning-Kruger. We should talk about uh, superficial uh, hubris. That uh, if you think you know a little bit, and you know you think all of a sudden that you know a lot because you know a hundred times more than you knew before, but in the fathom of that particular subject, you really know nothing. It's the old thing, uh, fake it until you make it. There are a lot of people like that. I, I know more than a few on uh, certain things. They really do fake it until they make it. And that actually can be successful. If they keep faking it, however, it'll usually bite them in the butt. People are like, you know, this guy is extremely confident. One of the uh, huge, and this has uh, been studied over and over again by sociologists, is that, and this is fascinating, you should look this up, people give about a hundred times more credence, I'm being rough here and, and uh, saying a hundred times, more credence into a confident fool than they do in a hesitant uh, wise person on a particular subject. You know, they're hesitant to talk about it. As Socrates said, uh, I'm intelligent because I know I know nothing. Essentially, that's what he said. Um, the more you know, the more you find out that you don't really know. Uh, that doesn't apply to everything, of course. But uh, when it comes to metaphysics and philosophy, it certainly does. There's an irreducible way around that. It's called abduction and retroduction. There's, of course, there's platonic, monistic methodology for understanding the, you know, the grand scheme and uh, natural order. Instead of studying tomes and tomes of volumes, you, know, you have to read 100 pages to find one morsel of absolute truth. Uh, Neoplatonism and like Advaita Vedanta and the Upanishads is incredibly pithy, so you can actually able to get a lot without uh, consuming enormous, copus, uh, enormous uh, copious amounts of uh, literature, like reading Hegel. You could read uh, Hegel's Phenomenology, and there's only like three sentences in there that are worthy of reading, you know, twice. It's just a lot of logomachy, which means blather. Um, it's no different than the old saying that there's old drivers, and then there's bold di drivers. By bold, I mean dangerous. You ever seen, and I used to ride a motorcycle, and I got hit a couple times on a motorcycle, and I didn't want to end up paralyzed. I don't ride a motorcycle anymore. My last motorcycle was the Yamaha Seca too. Bold drivers just means a dangerous driver. I've seen those motorcycle drivers that weave between traffic. It's like, oh my God, that's so dangerous. There's old, old drivers, cyclists. There's bold cyclists. But there's no old, bold cyclists. The reason being, of course, is that you can only be dangerous and stupid for so long. It's like pulling the handle on uh, the slot machine until it'll pay out. And by pay out, in the case of a bold uh, motorcyclist, it means you're gonna get seriously hurt or worse. Um, the problem with the world is that intelligent, I should say wise, people are full of doubts, 
while the uh, stupid ones are full of confidence. I forget who said that, so that particular quote. This one's from Thomas Sowell. I like Thomas Sowell's uh, quotes uh, quite a lot. Uh, people who are scariest to me are the people who don't even know enough to realize how little they actually know. That's a good one. Um, people love confidence. They don't love wisdom and they don't love uh, experience. I mean, true people, someone has a mind does, but the vast majority of people, because uh, small minds have slogans, and we see that a lot uh, in the world today. Isn't that incredible? that uh, the people that fake it until they make it are people that are extremely confident. They are far, far more appealing than people that actually have uh, wisdom and experience. I dealt with this in debating Buddhism for decades, which I have. Uh, yeah. Still always eager to do it, however, my life is so busy. There are people that will like read a couple pop books on Zen or some sort of uh, trash that they got at the bookstore. And it's like, I've read a few books, and I've been, you know, sitting in chicken taza on my Zafu and Zabotan cushions, and you don't know what you're talking about. You're just like a fat, tattooed uh, bull guy on uh, YouTube. I was like, let's, let's debate this topic. They think they know what they're talking about. You can't actual, uh, actually have a discussion with them because they're so close-minded. They, they completely refuse to have a basis of uh, discussion. It's like, we don't have to have a point of reference here. If we're going to discuss, you know, anatta, anatman, and what it means, then there actually have to be a basis for saying, you know, what is the, what is, there's that moth flying around. <laughs> I have a, a, a photography buddy that uh, is visiting for me from uh, New Jersey, and I think he left the door open a little too long. He's staying at a hotel. Um, What's the point of uh, discussion? You know, what is going to be the point of reference? Like, everything on a religious debate is sola scriptura. Like, if, if to give an example, to, you know, understand it better, if we were to debate what Christianity's doctrine is on agape or something else, like, well, we're going to have to reference the Bible because that, of course, is the ultimate point of reference, and that's sola scriptura. Martin Luther, one movie you really, really, really should see, I don't care if you care about Lutheranism or not, it's such a good movie about debate, and it's really so good. It's called uh, Luther. I think it came out in the mid-90s. It's a movie. And uh, there are all these Catholic priests and, you know, these guys wearing gold and, you know, garnets on their fingers and uh, fingers had all these rings. And they would say stuff, and he's like, Martin Luther is like, I don't care what you care think about Martin Luther. He's like, that's not in the Bible. That's actually not doctrinal. What it actually, oh, it made him so mad. I love it when people uh, can actually stay on point. It's like, we have to have a point of reference. If we're going to debate something, what is going to be the point of reference? And uh, anyway, I wanted to talk briefly about uh, Dunning-Kruger, but, uh, you know, it's just like spitting against the wind to debate these people. It's like, here are the facts. I don't care whether you agree with them or not, unless you have something intelligent to say, and you can give me a quotation, you know, whatever that is, you know, then it's left there. You, you don't ever try to convince anybody. You should never try to convert anybody, and I've never tried to do this. Like, you know, we're debating this. This is the point of reference. Here's the fact. Boom, 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 boom. You know, unless you have something intelligent to say, the debate is over. You know, if you make a claim, you have to substantiate it. What a lot of these people do that suffer from the Dunning-Kruger effect, like what I've experienced for decades in debating metaphysics, is that uh, they will make a claim and they will wiggle and squirm. They will never, ever, and they can't ever back up what they say. They have neither the doctrine or the book and verse citation to back it up, but they also, too, don't even have, I don't even need that. It's like, I don't even need, which you should have, the doctrinal book and uh, verse citation to back up your claim, because claims require substantiation. You have to have either some logical proof or some sort of train of logic that follows your claim. That if you don't have it, then it's over with. You've lost. You know, it's not a, a game of like who wins and loses. It's you made a claim. It's like a doing a drive-by. You know, they do a drive. They make a claim. Yeah, it's like you ever heard somebody like cuss at you as they're driving high speed and yeah, blah, blah, and then speed off. Well, that's just that's when someone makes a claim and they don't substantiate it. It's like a drive-by. Um, so much of the world suffers this. They don't have logical minds. They don't know how to debate. Claim, evidences. Um, there are some classes in college on logic, but they really don't teach the fundamentals. Um, 
I've actually enjoyed, it's made my mind sharper along with chess and reading certain materials because I always knew my teachers were fools. You know, I hung out in the library. I could quickly identify whether a book was worth reading or not. Like, life is short. I'm not going to... Some people, they'll literally, like, grab a 500-page book. They'll read half or most of it. It's like, this book's no good. It's like, it takes me 30 seconds to determine that. But it'll take someone else... You know, why do you have to read half of a horrible book? It's like, this book's not very good. You, you just waste it. God knows how much time doing that. I don't know why people... I know why people do that. It's just a lack of wisdom. A lack of discernment, actually, not specifically of wisdom. But, uh, anyway, that's the Dunning-Kruger effect in a nutshell. And I hate saying Dunning-Kruger. It's just certainty over wisdom. It's hubris and certainty over wisdom. We don't say Dunning-Kruger. It's say certainty and hubris over actual knowledge and wisdom. It's like you don't know what you're talking about. Um, I remember a good one. I used to work at this place and this guy was talking about uh, ways to do things in an emergency event. And this other guy I've known for a while, he's a short little guy, but he's a Navy SEAL. <laughs> uh, his favorite thing to show everybody was uh, him, a picture of him in Afghanistan with, uh, who's that? Uh, Dick Cheney. Yeah, Dick Cheney. It was like him and SEAL team. I forget which SEAL team it was. Uh, and there was Dick Cheney was there when he visited Afghanistan. So this guy knew his stuff, okay? So this guy, <laughs> this is the Dunning and Kruger. This guy, you know, he knew some things, but he didn't really know anything. And he made this claim. And the Navy SEAL guy said, no, that's not true, because boom, 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 boom. <laughs> it's like, what do you know? Anyway, he looked at him. It was about uh, tactics and things you would do, um, SWAT-related sort of stuff. And, you know, na what Navy SEALs, uh, one of the things that they really get is, like, super advanced uh, SWAT techniques. And I was <laughs> standing right there, and the little short guy, because he doesn't look, you know, it's hard to imagine a Navy SEAL being a kind of a short guy, but they do have them. He's like, oh, I, I'm a Navy SEAL. And he whips out his phone and he shows a picture of him and his uh, Navy SEAL team. <laughs> and the guy showed up right on the spot. Oh, I'll never forget that. That's so good. It's like, who are you? The guy said, like, the guy, the little shorter guy didn't know. And he was like, oh, I'm a Navy SEAL. Boom! Mic drop. <laughs> oh, God. <clears throat> anyway, I want to discuss the topic because. People say Dunning-Kruger effect, they'll say it in comments, they'll say this or that. There's a few things that I know an enormous amount about, metaphysics, uh, cameras, especially lenses. Um, the Thurmanara Anatman, original Buddhist doctrine, uh, emanationistic metaphysics. I can easily say that on the topics of Anatta or Anatman and emanationistic metaphysics, there's nobody on this earth that knows more than I do. I literally mean that. Is there still stuff to learn? Oh, God, yes, of course there is. Not a whole lot. But uh, those are, unfortunately, the things, uh, except for the lenses, which, you know, kind of the lens sniffer or the lens whisperer, um, the things that I'm supreme expert at, such as monistic metaphysics and the philosophy thereof, and Anara and Atman, and the Via Negativa methodology of apophatic theology, there's about that many people in the world that care about it. So I'm the grand expert on something that this many people care about. <laughs> what a good it does me, huh? It'd be good if I was the guru at the stock market. I could have like retired to a private island or something and been able to have a real vacation, which I've never been able to have. I'm nearly 50 years old, never had a real vacation. I guess I never will have a real vacation, especially now that the world is shut down for no good reason, by the way. Anyway, I hope you like this video. If you do, any donation is welcome. Or you can tell me how much you hated it. Thank you so much for watching. Lux Everetus.